Okay, yeah, good morning, um, everyone, and welcome to the second session of the AI Applied to Medical Imaging seminar series. My name is Ines Machado, and along with Dimitri Kassler, we organize these monthly talks. Uh, we are both uh, postdoc researchers. So Dimitri works in the Department of Radiology here at Adam Brooks under the supervision of uh, Tristan uh, Barrett. And I work in the CRUK Cambridge Institute under the supervision of Mireya Crispin Ortuzar. And the goal of these uh, seminar series is to exchange ideas and information on artificial intelligence applied to medical imaging um, and to bring together clinicians, radiologists, uh, oncologists, uh, and scientists, engineers. Uh, so uh, now uh, Dimitri will introduce uh, the speaker uh, today. So Dimitri, over to you. Thank you, Ines. And uh, also very warm welcome from me. Um, pleased to introduce to you Nikita. Sushrenti, Sush sorry, Sushrentsev, and uh, he's a final year PhD student and the supervision of Tristan Ferret. He also in the Department of Radiology, and his work primarily relates to quantitative MRI and also metabolic imaging of the prostate, but he's also dabbed into a few more of uh, combining radiomics and also machine learning techniques to sort of tease out a bit more of the prostate MRIs that, uh, yeah, to see if we can, we can determine any sort of quantitative biomarkers from imaging that is inherently non-quantitative. And that's also what we'll present on today. And uh, yeah, sadly, Nikita isn't feeling 100%, so we're presenting virtually today, but that shouldn't be any issue. So feel free to ask any questions via the chat or afterwards, uh, yeah, just unmute yourself and ask away and also here. Yeah. Okay, Nikita. Thank you, Dimitri, for your kind introduction, and thank you both Ines and Dimitri for organizing this wonderful seminar series. I very much enjoyed the first talk by Kahal, and therefore I was even more pleased to be invited. Um, let's just kick off and talk about some prostate cancer radiomics. So I'm Nikita, and as Dimitri has said, I'm a final year PhD student at the department working with Tristan Barrett on prostate MRI. And the plan of our today's talk, which I hope will involve more questions than actually me just plainly talking, will be first of all to talk about prostate cancer active surveillance and how does it work? Because I'm a clinician by background and my area of research is mostly a clinical application of AI or metabolic imaging. So I'm approaching things from a clinical angle. And as we're going to talk about a very specific clinical concept today, I think it's important that we are all on the same page and we understand how it actually works. We'll then talk about the role of conventional proton MRI in active surveillance without any quantitative elements to, to it. And we'll then consider some of the clinical challenges that could potentially be addressed with machine learning and AI in medical imaging. We'll then specifically talk about our attempts to use conventional radiomics to solve the baseline enrollment challenge. Then we'll talk about delta radiomics in the follow-up assessment challenge. And we, this will almost logically lead us to the concept of time series radiomics that I wanted to focus on today. And after that, we'll talk about future directions. And I hope we'll have a few questions to, to discuss because I think it's, it's, it's very interactive and I, I really enjoyed the Q&A session last time. So what was the title of the talk? Why is this title top of flop? Well, wh wherever there's a new kid on the block, you know, you kind of think, well, it looks promising, looks kind of nice, seems to solve all your challenges. Well, actually, is it going to work in the long run? The, well, probably we'll come to the answer at the end of the talk. And I'm a United fan, but I mean, just had to put this guy on because he's uh, more in the headlines these days. So prostate hey. cancer active surveillance. Uh, let's chat about new cases who present with prostate cancer. Now, 50% of those have locally advanced or metastatic disease and are outside the remit of our today's presentation. But 50% of patients have organ confined disease and 20% of these will have large Gleason 7 tumors with high percentage pattern four and they would normally undergo immediate treatment because they fall into the area of intermediate unfavorable risk. But 30% of those patients actually have low or intermediate favorable risk. They either have small Gleason 6 tumors that are not even visible on MRI, 
or they have Gleason 7 tumors with low percentage pattern 4. And for these guys, we assume that active surveillance is the optimum management option. And how does active surveillance work? So when we enroll patients at baseline, we have their PSA, PSA density, all the clinical measurements. We have their pre-biopsy MRI, which does or does not show a tumor or a suspicious focus. And then we, we, we ha absolutely must have their biopsy normally guided by, by MRI. And the biopsy would normally show a 3 plus 3 or 3 plus 4 disease, as I've just said. And that's a baseline. Normally then these patients would undergo either community or hospital PSA checkups every two, four months or six months, depending on the clinical guidelines. And then they would come back for the follow-up MRI. And then the cycle repeats itself however many times until there is a concern for, for, for progression, either because something on the MRI has changed or PSA has been increasing. And then uh, patients would undergo repeat biopsy. And depending on the presence of progression on that biopsy, they would either undergo treatment or they would keep being monitored on active surveillance. So again, the goal of active surveillance as a whole is to reduce over-treatment of indolent disease that would never kill a patient. And that's the, the, the overall concept. Uh, and as you can see here, and that's what we're gonna talk about today, active surveillance roughly has two major parts to it. One is the baseline enrollment, and the second is the follow-up monitoring. And we're gonna talk about how we're gonna utilize MR for this. So the role of conventional MR in active surveillance, and first and foremost, it, it entered active surveillance from the perspective of baseline enrollment. And the goal here is to identify patients suitable for preferably long-term active surveillance. The patients are low, or intended favorable risk that can stay on active surveillance for years. And then we, we all know that the whole purpose of introdu introducing pre-biopsy AMR in the clinical practice is driven by its superior ability to detect clinically significant prostate cancer compared to standard trust and PSA patterns. So MRI is good. MRI is therefore good for baseline selection. However, we, we see that the poor positive predictive value of detecting clinically significant prostate cancer is quite low. And that's a problem. It's low and variable across different centers because prostate MR is very experience dependent, et cetera, et cetera. However, the pooled negative predictive value of ruling out clinically significant prostate cancer, which is key for this concept of active surveillance patient selection, is very, very high. And particularly, this is driven by the fact that if you do not see MRI visible disease, it's a good thing. Whereas um, conversely, if you see a tumor on your MRI, it is actually a poor prognostic factor in all active, active surveillance studies to date. And if you see the tumor or you don't see it, you can use your baseline MRI to vary the follow-up. You can follow up some patients more stringently, or otherwise you can, you can say, well, you don't have MRI visible lesion, your PSA is very low, you have a Gleason 3 plus 3 tumor in just one biopsy core, go home for the next two years, and then only come back after that. In the follow-up monitoring, so MRI is obviously used to, to, to re-evaluate the risk of developing tumors that are outside the active surveillance enrollment criteria. So you're monitoring every single scan according to precise guidelines that were developed by folks at UCL. You're effectively comparing every new scan against the baseline. And then for precise, the pool sensitivity is 75, the specificity is 95, again, for detecting prostate cancer progression. And only five studies, including one from our center, have been published to date. And you have to treat this with a pinch of salt because they all come from tertiary referral centers, university hospitals, with readers like Tristan reviewing the scans. And going forward, we'll see what happens when you go to the real life scenario with centers that are not as good in, in prostate MR. The one final point here about the role of MR in active surveillance is that the number of scans is growing year by year. And that's, that's the data from our own center, Addenbrooks. In black, you can see the overall number of prostate MR scan. And in, in, and in red, you can see the active surveillance scan. So this population is growing year by year. So we'll have more and more and more scans to deal with. So we have to somehow find a way to maybe improve the way we assess these images. And that's where radiomics and quantitative imaging uh, 
can come into play. So a key message here is, as you've already realized, MR is critical throughout active surveillance from baseline to follow up monitoring. Now, in terms of active surveillance challenges, you can see this example case here, whereby we had an MR visible lesion at baseline, it was recent people with three tumor, and just in three years time, we noted a gross radiological progression on the final MRI scan, which triggered a repeat biopsy that showed clinical progression to the intermediate unfavorable prostate cancer. And you would say, well, look, well, that's actually the goal of active surveillance, right? We don't expect patients with cancer to magically cure themselves. However, the problem is that 30% of patients show five-year histopathological progression on active surveillance, and that is too soon. Patients in PROTECT trial have stayed on active surveillance for 10 or 15 years, and that's what we really want to see. And the unmet clinical need here is therefore improved baseline risk stratification. A patient like this on this slide should theoretically have never been on active surveillance, simply because they would progress too soon and would rather treat this patient at the very baseline to avoid losing resources, having extra scans to report, PSA surveillance, clinical appointments, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at active surveillance overall, you would think that it's a cost-saving strategy. However, it is not. When you have patients who progress really quickly, and in this guise, you'd say, treat them at the very baseline uh, and then monitor them following treatment, which is by far not, not as stringent. So how would we approach this challenge with radiologists? Well, obviously you have your baseline MRI scan, you have your clinical parameters, and you would try to supplement your clinical data with the quantitative imaging derived from those tumors to predict your outcome. So we had 71 patients with 73 MR visible lesions with a median follow-up of five years, 35 of them were progressors, and that's histopathological progression, which is a stringent criteria for progression, and 38 was stable both radiologically and histologically, and hence the relatively low sample size, but we really wanted to make sure that we have the ground truth in all cases included in this study. So all these patients were scanned at three Tesla in our center using the same protocol, and T2 and ADC were used for tumor delineation. And I have to stress, and I'll get back to it at the very end, that all of these studies were done in patients with MR visible disease, because if you don't see anything in the prostate, there is no focus to outline. And you know, this is all tumor derived radionics. So that was our very first take on, on radionics in general. And we, we had a great help from Leonardo Rundo, who's our key collaborator ever since. And we started off with selecting of the appropriate number of bins with the highest number of highly robust features. We then uh, tested the intrinsic dependency analysis against MRI acquisition, although they were all scanned on 3T using the same protocol. There could have been some minor variations depending on the year of scans, so we wanted to make sure that we remove any features that correlated with scanning parameters. Well then, I'll talk a bit about this in a second, we did some feature selection and predictive modeling, and since the sample size wasn't that high, we went for leave one out cross-validation because splitting them into training and test sets to us seemed to be um, not particularly helpful, especially at this very early proof of concept stage. So a number of bins here that ended up uh, harboring the most number of robust features were 128, and then off we go. If we look at clinical parameters between progressors and non-progressors at baseline, we'll see that only PSA and PSA density showed significant difference between the two groups, whereas everything else like Likert score or biopsy grade group the target present in peripheral transition zone, they were all the same, as you would expect from a normal active surveillance population. And then effectively, as you all know, well, there's no consensus on which particular um, feature selection algorithms or indeed predictive modeling algorithms work best. Well, we don't really know whether random forest is, is better than some other types of networks. So it was maybe a little bit of a fishing exercise, but we, we tried a combination of different feature selection and predictive modeling algorithms. And what we had was on the X axis, you'll see the feature selection algorithms and on the Y axis, it's predictive modeling algorithms. You see, we, 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 we tested clinical parameters alone, then T2 radiomics and ADC radiomics on their own, and then all their different combinations, you see, T2 with, with clinical, ADC versus clinical, radiomics, 
and the combination of all of them. And what we found in the end was that the addition of T2-weighted radiomics to clinical parameters that included PSA, PSA density, Likert score, and biopsy grade group has improved the overall performance. And bear in mind that that's small sample size, single scanner, leave one out cross-validation. That's just a proof of concept. Well, in theory, adding radiomics to clinical parameters could potentially be helpful in addressing this baseline prediction challenge by you know, excluding more patients from active surveillance for whom it is not suitable and just being more confident in what you're doing clinically. But then the following active surveillance challenge is the follow-up monitoring challenge. In fact, you can see that on this particular uh, example, well, I don't see a gross radiological progression of this tumor. And that's, you know, that's the kind of, I think people would agree with me and clinically it wasn't reported. However, when the protocol biopsy was done after three years, which is the standard of practice in our own center, again, this showed a clinically significant progression to intermediate unfavorable cancer, but no way MRI could have detected this just based on this sort of example. And the problem here is that the precise scoring system is rather subjective. So precise scoring system, how it works, it's a five scale system of subjective assessment of your MR images. If it scores one to three, effectively there is no change or improvement and therefore no action is required. Well, and obviously if you look at the example above, I think all of those scans would have scored precise three as they did in clinical practice. Then there's a very interesting category of precise four, which says if you see increase in size and or conspicuity, then it's precise for its radiological progression. And here we in our center would consider a repeat biopsy earlier than it perhaps should have done. And then precise five is clear, it's definite radiological stage progression. I mean, the tumor goes out of the capsule. It's very clear, so there's no question here, you just escalate treatment immediately. But the trouble is that there's no objective definition of radiological disease progression such as precise four. Well, what exactly is the increase in size? what exactly is conspicuity and how you treat this. We, we tried to address this in a different paper, not using radiomics, but that's not subject of today's discussion. And then what this results in is if you pull the performance of serial MRI and active surveillance, you can see a moderate performance. It's just sensitivity of 60%, specificity of 75, it's high variation across centers and it is reader dependent. So it does create a healthcare inequality for patients who are monitored in centers not like Cambridge, who don't have expert radiologists such as Tristan looking at their MRs. And even Tristan wouldn't really uh, manage this case above because that's very equivocal. So the unmet clinical need here is to develop means for objective serial MRI assessment to standardize reporting and give confidence across the board to any radiologist who is not even expert in the field, that they have some standard way of assessing those images. So as you know, delta radiomics is again, a conventional approach whereby you have the baseline and the final scan. You extract radiomic features from both of them. You calculate the date delta, which is effectively the change. And you would think that the magnitude of change in radiomic features in progressors would be different from non-progressors. And that's how the concept works. So we try that in our cohort, we, we got 64 patients, 27 progressors, 37 stable. Again, this was the same scanner, same protocol. They all had biopsy after the final MRI, both progressors and non-progressors. So we really knew the ground truth in both cases. And then the pipeline essentially was similar. We extracted those features, we chose the number of bins, we did the robustness analysis and intrinsic dependency analysis, and we only chose the features that were robust at both baseline and in the final MR. We calculated the delta, and again, we went for feature selection, predictive modeling, and that was, that was the end of, of the pipeline. And here, we tried fewer modeling algorithms. We, we, we chose just three, which were paranclitic networks, a lot of which has been developed by Oleg and his team at UCL, and he may talk about this later if you have any questions about that, the lasso, random forest, and then precise as the clinical gold standard. So what we saw was that effectively the performance of any modeling method that you would choose for delta radiomics was similar to precise. It wasn't different. Precise was still a bit better, but there was no significant difference in either of them. 
And in, in fact, what is important is that if you look at specificity PPV, that was the highest for precise, the random forests higher sensitivity and NPV in this case. So effectively, again, this is a very proof of concept stuff, lots of limitations that have to be overcome, but Delta radiomics as a concept achieves comparable performance to expert derived precise, and it is complementary in the way that it can give you better sensitivity and NPV where precise is struggling. And that could be something that's um, potentially usable in, in the clinic, provided we overcome challenges that we're gonna talk about over the next few slides. And then logically we're thinking, well, Delta radiomics is an approach that only allows you to use just the two scans, but we have lots of scans in the interim. So we're potentially losing some important data that could inform the model. So what if we try and analyze all of these scans at once? And that's the way the concept that we sort of termed as, as the time series radiomics. Again, we had 76 patients, follow up, stable, progressors, uh, all the same criteria applied. A total of 297 scans analyzed. All the scans, again, were on the same 3T magnet because, well, if it didn't work in the ideal setting, no way it would work in a non-ideal scenario with different vendors. The pipeline, again, was pretty similar. Um, we, we, we only chose the features that were robust at all time points in all patients. So that was pretty strict. And at the end, we ended up with 17 features for T2 and 27 for ADC. Then we, then we again quantified the delta radiomics using paraclitic networks. That was the best performing approach in the previous study. And we used recurrent neural networks for time series radiomics and leave one on cross validation for, for, for the performance assessment. And here you can see the time series curves for some of the MRI features. And it's important to note that the time here flows from sort of right to left. So zero is the point of the end of active surveillance, which is either progression or just the moment where the patients were censored. And you can clearly see that there's difference between progressors that are in red and non-progressors who are in yellow, orange, pinkish color um, for some of those features that, that we've been seeing. And also importantly, we shouldn't really be losing some of the clinical parameters that we're collecting alongside the MRs, and that's PSA and PSA density, which is PSA divided by prostate volume. And if we looked at the time series changes of these two markers, you can clearly see that PSA density gives you a nicer variation between progressors and non-progressors. So for all the radiomics models, delta and time series, we also included either delta PSA density between the first and last scans and for time series from the old, all of the scans that we had in the analyses. So at the end of the day, if we looked at the performance of delta radiomics and adding delta PSA density to it, we really saw no major improvement, although the addition of PSA density in numbers gave a slightly better performance. But for time series radiomics, obviously the addition of PSA density, the time series setting significantly improved the performance of the combined model compared to the standalone PSA density in time series radiomics. And looking at, at them in the combination, in fact, time series radiomics and PSA density showed a slightly better performance overall than even precise, although obviously that was, none of this was significant. And here you can see that time series radiomics does give you slightly better specificity and positive predictive value, whereas precise has better sensitivity and NPV. That's something that sort of we have seen previously that they are in fact complementary. So the take home message is here that the inclusion of all available time points does improve model performance, which you would sort of expect. And the time serial radiomics does outperform conventional delta radiomics, <coughs> excuse me, and can therefore address the follow-up monitoring challenge, perhaps in a better way. Also because the clinically you never know when exactly is this last time point going to occur that you use in delta radiomics that is followed up by the biopsy. And finally, the time series radiomics as a concept does set out a new field in AI-driven radiology research because it can be applied to any scenario that uses serial imaging, either treatment response or just a follow-up assessment and active monitoring. And there's only been two papers that used uh, three scans using deep learning approaches, 
that analyze the sort of serial changes in, in the setting of lung cancer treatment response assessment, but no studies as we, as we know were done with conventional radiomics and the time series setting. So what are the challenges then? In terms of active surveillance specifically, we've already touched upon it, but 50% of these patients have no MRI visible disease and some of them still show progression. And as I've said, all of these studies have been done with tumor derived features. So we really want to move towards the whole gland segmentation that would make this applicable to all patients that are enrolled in active surveillance. Then what's the generalizability of these findings? Because if we move to multi-scanner and multi-site validation, well, are these models going to hold? I doubt that. Well, will we be able to develop new models? I think that's the challenge of radiomics as a whole, particularly in MRI. <coughs> now, the other point that we haven't addressed in this specific study, well, how exactly do you perform feature selection in the time series setting? Do you just have those plots for all these features in the time series and you try and you know, subjectively select those that show the largest variation between progressors and non-progressors? Well, that's a bit subjective, but I mean, how do you do it objectively in the time series setting for each individual scan? That's a bit uncertain and we can discuss that uh, in the Q&A session. And then finally, well, okay, radiomics is fine, but it's semi-automated, requires segmentation and all sorts of other things, versus the fully automated deep learning, how would it perform in the same scenario and would one be better than the other? Because with fully automated stuff, you just leave it and the clinician has minimal involvement in this. And finally, the question behind this presentation, well, actually is it top or flop, will only be answered in the prospective validation in multi-center active surveillance cohorts in multiple scans once we have addressed all of the above challenges and limitations of this work. And with that, I'd like to thank you um, and the organizers and all our collaborators for this work and hopefully we'll continue. And looking forward to your questions.